Roy and Chris here. We want to take a moment and welcome you to our Sunday morning service. We're so glad you've chosen to gather with us as a community as we worship and hear an amazing word today. It will be amazing. <laughs> yes, it will. I rocked it. We're so excited that you're joining us online today. Facebook, YouTube, and we'd love to meet you in person, live in the room if that were possible. We're at 847 York Street here in Cornwall, Ontario. If it's your very first time with us, a special welcome to you. We want to connect with you, get to know you, pray with you and for you, and serve you however we can. To get connected, go to hcfcornwall.ca slash connect, where you'll receive a gift so we can just say thank you for being with us today. God's doing some incredible things in our city and region. By joining us this morning, you're actually taking part in that. So I just want to encourage you, Come on, don't just watch the live stream. Grab your Bible when it's time for the preaching and make notes. During worship, stand up and be a part of what we're doing. We believe God is going to be with you. He's speaking to you. He's fulfilling in you hope, peace, and truth right there where you are watching today. We love you, Harvest, love and you we so believe much. you will be blessed as we gather today as a church family for today's service. Good morning, everybody. Why don't we stand up and let's worship. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Yeah. 
grave is empty And you know what I know Anything is possible Do you see what I see That the grave is empty And you know what I know Anything is possible Stronghold, it's time. 
let you break Cause there's freedom, there's freedom Come on, hurry, sing it out I'm running out of the grave I'm running out of the grave Sickness, get out of my way Cause there's healing, there's healing here I'm running out of the grave I'm running out of the grave Stronghold, it's time that you break Cause there's freedom there's freedom here Come alive, come alive Let dead things come to life Come alive, come alive Let dry bones come alive Come alive, come alive Let dead things come to life Come alive, come alive Let dry bones come alive There's resurrection
Oh 
There's a theme this morning. You know, it's breaking out. It's being set free. I don't know what's holding you down this morning, or I don't know what's got you bound, but today's the day to let it go. You know, it wasn't meant for you to carry the baggage. Jesus took it for us, and we're approaching Easter, and you know, our Jesus loves us. He's for you, and whatever you're carrying this morning, I just wanna encourage you to let it go this morning. Lay it at the feet of Jesus, and don't pick it back up. That was never his intention. He wants you to let go and, and live your life in freedom. I just, I, I just, our whole set list this morning is just walking out of the grave, dancing out of the grave, freedom out of the grave. I don't know what grave you're in, but I'm telling you this morning, you gotta get out of the grave. This is an amazing day. We are approaching Easter, and, and I think we're gonna see miracle after miracle after miracle. And I know in our own family, as a pastor, and, and you think, oh, they got it all together. I'm here to tell you, we are so far from having it together. You know, we are believing for miracles for our children. We're believing for miracles with a son with special needs to say, why not, God? Why not? You know what? I believe in miracles, and I believe in faith to see the miracles come forth. I'm just going to pray this morning. And whatever you're believing for your miracle, I want you to put your both feet on the ground this morning. Say, Jesus, I trust you. I'm not carrying this anymore. I'm not holding on to this anymore. It was never mine. You went to the cross for my sins. You went to the cross for my freedom. You went to the cross for me. Not for my neighbor, not for the person down the street, but for me. Father, we just thank you this morning, God, that we are breaking out of graves this morning, God. Whatever has people held down, God, I am praying freedom. I don't know every situation, but God, you do. Father, we're praying for the churches of our city, for St. Francis Catholic Church, Salvation Army, St. John's Presbyterian, St. Therese. God, we just pray for freedom in their churches this morning. God, I pray a, a, just a Holy Ghost revival in every church in Cornwall this morning, God. Just that people will come and flood our churches. That every church in Cornwall will not even have seating capacity. God, that those will come to know you, Father. Our job is, God, to bring the lost into the kingdom. God, for families this morning and for healings, God, for people that have received cancer diagnosis and other diagnoses, oh, Father, we're just praying for a full and complete healing this morning. Come on, why not, Father? We know you are the God of miracles. You are the God of provision. You are the God of healing, and you are the God that loves us. Father, we just thank you this morning. God, I pray for Easter as it's quickly approaching. Father, those that will enter our doors that won't know you, or it may be some that haven't even heard about you. But Jesus, they will have a divine experience with you, Father, over the Easter weekend. And God, for those that are battling with mental health, God. Father, just clear their minds this morning. Give them freedom of those things that plague them, God. Freedom, God, to just walk freely. Father, just bless each and every person here this morning, their families. God, we just love you so much, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Have a seat. My name is Chris, for those that don't know me. Our kids are now dismissed, and the parents said amen. Our little ones are going out over here, and our bridge is exiting through these doors. Bridge is for grades five, six, and seven, and our littles are from infancy, or one, two, four. So as they head out, have a great morning this morning. Uh, we love to give at Harvest, and the ways to give are behind me on the screen, so you can check that out. And can you believe that Easter is two weeks away? It's just time to stand still for no one. So Easter, two weeks, and we're really believing that we're gonna pack all our services. We have three services. We have one on Good Friday at 11 a.m., and then Easter Sunday morning at 9, 15, and 11. Our theme this year is coming home, and you know what a great um, time to invite someone to church. Uh, I can give you all my kids' um, phone numbers. You can invite them. <laughs> You know, come on, this is a great time to uh, invite a friend to church. And um, let's believe for those coming home. Those that we've been, have been just praying on our knees and moms and dads and grandmas and uncles and aunts. Let's believe this is a season of coming home this Easter season. Well, today, Pastor is uh, on week three of Relationship Killers. And um, they've been really good. They've been really stretching, but they have been really, really good. Um, 
If you want notes, raise your hand. Our lovely host team will bring you notes. Everyone must have notes, I'm assuming. Well, let's turn our eyes to the screens before Pastor comes with this morning's word. Hey there, welcome to Harvest. If you're new to the family or you're new to following Jesus, we are inviting you to step one. Step one is a session that will inform you and inspire you. You'll learn about our history as a church, where we've been, and our vision, where we're going. You'll understand why we do the things we do and how you can be a part of it too. To register for step one, simply go to hcfcornwall.ca slash step one. Or if you're in the room, chat with one of our hosts after the service. We can't wait to serve you, get to know you, and help you thrive on your journey. Good morning. It is so great to see everybody. I just want to fuss over our online congregation this morning in the house. Give it up for our online congregation this morning. People that are watching uh, from all over the place. And I'm pausing this morning just to remind us that we do have those who attend Harvest that aren't here in the room. And uh, again this week, and I, I don't think a week goes by without uh, I'm meeting somebody, sometimes for the very first time, and they'll introduce themselves, hey, I attend the church, and I go, okay, uh, do I know you? And no, because I attend online, I enjoy the services, I enjoy being a part of what's happening at Harvest, and so we really do uh, love and, and um, cherish those of you that are online from all over the place, and that you call this your home church, we appreciate that. And we bless you this morning as you're watching, or you may pick up the stream later on uh, this week. I'd also like to just uh, honor a couple that are here. Jay and Shannon Brink are in the house with their family. You guys just kind of wave. Uh, John and Mary's firstborn, Jay, and I think the first wedding that we did uh, as you married Shannon here at Harvest a number of years ago. That's a lot of years ago. And... Uh, you guys, I just want to honor you because of giving your life and serving as a family on the mission field. It's just uh, uh, amazing how God has used your lives and um, different places in Africa. And we just so appreciate that and that you would do that. And um, Shannon is, uh, you're all home on a furlough, but Shannon's studying at uh, UWO to expand her medical uh, certificates so that she can uh, be a bigger blessing overseas. And, um, and I'm aware, just because it's on our prayer list at Harvest, and some of you have been praying, that Shannon's been dealing with uh, lack of sleep. And um, as I was just thinking about that as we were in worship this morning, um, I just, you know, the Bible says that no weapon formed against us can prosper. And I believe this is a weapon. I really believe that the enemy is trying to um, just minimize this time of study and take away from you when this is a time that you're to be filled up. I mean, it's hard enough with family and hard enough as you're trying to study. And I would just like to pause as a congregation online. We're going to pray for Shannon here in a moment and just believe for this thing to break off of you and you to be free and, and to have sleep and, um, and, and just have rest. And it, it's more than sleep and rest. There's something that God wants to pour in. I, I believe there's a repositioning happening while you're here. I think that um, as you get ready and you're strategizing, and I'm not aware of what's happening, but I just sensed in God that there's a repositioning. There's something that God is doing to uh, bring a multiplying effect to both of your lives and your family's lives on the mission field. Uh, there's an exponential where one puts a thousand, you know, two puts 10,000. I just feel like there's some things aligning, repositioning. So don't be afraid of some changes. I think change is on its way. Uh, it almost seemed like, as I'm hearing, from, hearing this from the Lord, that it might be a little disruptive and wondering what's going to happen. But just remember God spoke, and if this is a good word, then you'll be able to use it, um, that this repositioning and these changes are to actually increase the multiplying factors. To, for you to see, I think it's sometimes being even frustrated that it can't be what you dream about in your hearts. And I think God's going to bring the dream to pass. Thus, the enemy attack, and no weapon form. Let's just stretch our hands out toward Jay and Shannon. Would you guys just mind standing? Uh, and uh, we're just going to 
as a congregation pray today. Father, I just thank you for this amazing couple, Lord, that stand here in our midst. It's an honor and a privilege that they would even be here with us today. Lord, ambassadors, Lord, of the kingdom of God worldwide. Lord, that there's a level of which they, uh, they, they labor. There's a, a, a level, Lord, at which they are serving that, uh, Lord, I just believe today that the enemy has overplayed his hand. And Lord, that we would just stand firm right now and in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, command sleeplessness. You've got to go now. Every attack on Shannon's physical body, you cannot attack any longer. Lord, I thank you that the Bible says that that weapon uh, formed against us can't prosper because you're the one, Lord, who formed the blacksmith that's trying to form the weapon. And so, Lord, you are sovereign God of all. You're the one that called them. You're the one that equipped them. Lord, even at, at, in those sleepless nights as Shannon has cried out to you and said, Lord, but you're the one that said to do this. Lord, if you called me to do this, I need you to shift this and change this. But Lord, warfare was necessary. And today, in the name of Jesus, we take our place with these great soldiers. Lord, we come alongside them today. We battle on their behalf. And Lord, we thank you that it's been won. It's been done, Father. And we thank you now just a deep impartation of rest, Father, and of strength for them in these days. Lord, is there on furlough? But Lord, this repositioning. I pray, Lord, that behind the scenes, Lord, you're organizing. You're bringing all things together. Lord, I release this multiplying factor onto their lives now in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. 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 Well, that was fun. All right. The last installment of our relationship killers were looking at the word uh, fellowship, which is a, kind of a church word. We don't really use that uh, in our normal language. And so the Greek word, which is not that important, but important for us to know because it doesn't get translated really well in our English Bibles, and so I've just been saying koinonia, uh, and it means what we have in common with Jesus, that's his life, in common with each other, that's his life, and so when we are aligned with Jesus and aligned with each other, the house of God should have the life of Jesus evident flowing from person to person. Paul the apostle, talking to the Corinthian church that uh, we're allowing the relationship, the koinonia killers, to happen in their midst. He said, you know, there's a lack of supernatural power in the church of Corinth, and the reason is because you haven't recognized how important this is. And so here in our final installment, I'm going to look at judgment and uh, how judgment really is a big koinonia uh, killer. Uh, it's a barrier to allow the life of Jesus to flow in our community. In uh, Matthew, this isn't in your notes, but Matthew chapter 7, I just want to read it from the message version. Jesus said, don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. In the other versions, don't judge lest you be judged. Uh, with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you even more. It's not God judging us. The spirit of judgment in this world, Satan owns that. And this critical tearing down a spirit originates with the evil one. And what happens is as we give it out, it comes back even more, and we don't want to give it out. We want this to be a community where it is shame off, grace-filled, and people can grow, and that's what we want to talk about today. Lord, just help us understand, as Christina has said, that it has stretched, but Lord, you always stretch in order to increase capacity. You can pour more of that new wine in that we won't lose a drop. Lord, I'm praying that as Easter approaches, and Lord, you've honored us each and every year with so many visitors, so many first-timers that would come, and Lord, they would hear a message. Lord, some are in this room today that gave their lives to you last Easter. We're so thankful for that, and we're praying for the same this year. But Lord, we, we want to be those that create a house, a house filled with grace, a house where people can grow, a people, a, a house, Lord, where there is no shame, no judgment, and together we grow in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Well, let's kind of go to the origins just for a minute of judgment so we can kind of put our finger on it. Each, each uh, coin a killer, I've said, this is envy's bad, <laughs> um, you know, offense bad, and I've showed you why. Let's just quickly look at this. We'll go back to the garden, go back to Genesis, the book of beginnings. And uh, this is uh, God speaking to Adam and Eve. The Lord commanded the man, you are free. 
I love the freedom we have in Jesus. We sang about it today. You are free to eat of any tree in the garden. So enjoy life. I've made you that way. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are healthy boundaries that God places in our lives, and he placed in Adam and Eve. Specifically, this tree, as we're going to see in a moment, he said that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat of it, you will certainly die. Whether or not this was a little literal tree or uh, an, an allegory of um, a philosophy of doing life. Uh, it could be both, but it's definitely, uh, I'm saying it was probably, and it is a, a literal tree, but it wasn't a matter of just going up and biting into an apple, but it was accepting, they were not to accept a philosophy that the enemy uh, was, was going to uh, tempt Eve and she bought into, as you'll see in a moment. But the tree of life Enjoy life in God by having the life of God in us. And we unpacked a lot of that last week. Well, Satan gets Eve off alone one day and he asks her about the trees and asks her about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she says, no, and she rehearses what God said. And his, here, here's his response, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. We're talking about judgment this morning. And like all the relationship killers, the koinia killers, the life of God stoppers in a community of faith, the life of God, uh, or, or excuse me, the, 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 these stoppers all have their origins in the work of darkness. Satan was not appealing to her rebellion. She didn't have any. She's in the garden walking with God each and every day. He's not appealing to rebellion. Hey, Eve, Join my team. We're going to overthrow God. It's going to be great. We don't need God. You don't need this garden. Come and live with me in hell. It'll be awesome. <laughs> like, that's just, nobody's buying that. <laughs> so he's, not, he's not appealing to any sense of rebellion in her. He's appealing in the same way he's been appealing to religions ever since. That there is a way that can be, that you can get to God. There's another way to be like God. He said, if you do this, you'll be just like God. Say, just like God. Isn't that your goal? Isn't that mine? As a Christ follower, I want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? I want, to, I want my life to, to model my Father, the, the spiritual DNA, the life of God that's in me. And so the, the tree of life, we contain the life of God, therefore the likeness of God, the, the DNA of God, you could say it that way. And so we exhibit and we are like God. When we become born again, that righteousness of God is deposited into us, and we begin with the grace of God. We, we used the word in a couple weeks ago, sanctified, or we're, we're being washed from the old ways of thinking and becoming new and looking like Jesus. And Satan is saying to Eve, who's perfect, sinless, already just like God in that, in that way, and he says, hey, there's another way to do this another way? Another way? Yes. There's another pathway to knowing God. And the way it works is that you can know good and evil like God does. And then you get to be, listen now, you get to be the judge and you get to decide what is good for you and what is bad for you. You can be big grown-ups now, and you don't need God to tell you what's good for you and bad for you. Which, by the way, God never told them what was bad for them because there was nothing bad in the garden. They were living in his life, full stop. He said, you can continue doing that, enjoying freedom and life with me in this garden and with my, my life in you. But if you choose that way, that way leads to death. Well, they bought into giving up on having God's righteousness. They accepted the lie of Satan, self-righteousness. Say self-righteousness. I will judge if I'm good or bad. I will try to do good things, or maybe I don't try at all. But that's how we're born, in the philosophy of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're all born into that tree, self-appointed judges. 
We sit as judge of our own life, of this world, and of each other. And how's that working out in the world, by the way? Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The Lord speaking says, I search the heart and I examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Only God knows the heart, including ours. We don't even know our own heart. We do not know the heart of another. But the spirit of judgment, probably of all the things we've looked at, kills the hardest because of this origin that we sit as judge as opposed to letting God decide what is right and what is wrong. When we're born again, we have eaten of the tree of life and we have his life in us and we want his life to flow through us, but we have this tendency <laughs> to go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and try to eat there. And then we, that we, we find ourselves with pharisaical attitudes and, and just thinking about, you know, if you could just work enough, do enough, be enough, God will love you more. And when you taste of the life of God, the truth of the matter is there's nothing you can do to disqualify yourself from his love, and there's nothing you can do to gain more of it. We have all of it. Say all of his love. Judgment. As we look at a couple of areas this morning, when we go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as Christ followers, it's so deadly. The first one I want to look at is just something we've looked at before. We need, we'll just remind ourselves of this. But it's how we do discipleship at Harvest. The understanding of how we say discipleship, how Christ followers grow. How we grow spiritually. And we actually have an understanding of this, and it's worked into all of our environments, our Sunday morning environment, our, our environments on the dream team, and small group environments. This, this understanding of how people grow spiritually, and we want people to grow spiritually. Jesus wants us to grow spiritually. And I want to look at this parable this morning. It explains and understands how to create environments, garden, spiritual places, the house of God, where people can grow, where you can grow and I can grow and look like Jesus, but not in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in the vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. And so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Useless tree. Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I will cut it down. And let me just pull this parable apart uh, for us this morning. Jesus taught in parables. There was understanding uh, of farming pictures that they would have been uh, aware of in that day. And uh, fig trees and vineyards are, are, aren't really as common to us. Um, so let me, let me just unpack this for a second. A man had a fig tree going in a vineyard. Well, first of all, if you think about a vineyard, that makes sense, all the rows of grapes. But in the middle of this vineyard is a fig tree, kind of sticking out like a sore thumb. This lone fig tree, all by itself. And as we're going to read the story, it's a fig tree, it's got some problems. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, I think sometimes uh, that, you know, human nature, as we come to the house of God, the vineyard speaks of the place, of, uh, of the vine, and the, and the wine, and the life of God. And that symbolism is used all the way the scriptures uh, of Jesus said, come and abide in me, and I will abide in you. This idea of life in the vineyard, say life. But in the middle of the vineyard is a fig tree <laughs> with problems. <laughs> and when we're having problems, isn't that kind of how we feel? Like we stick out and we think nobody else is having problems at Harvest Christian Fellowship. I have all the problems. I am a fig tree in the middle of the vineyard and everybody knows I'm having problems. I don't want everybody to know I'm having problems. I'm sticking out and I'm feeling very obvious that I'm having problems problems, and to make it worse, there's a guy that keeps checking me and finding out if I'm growing. Fig tree in the garden. You ever feel that way? Or am I the only one that feels like a fig tree sometimes in the middle of the vineyard? Only three of us. I'll keep going. All right. Fig tree's got some problems. 
By the way, evaluation is not a bad thing. I want to be very clear about that. Looking for evidence that we're growing spiritually. We talk about taking your next, next steps. We think that's really, really important. Sometimes we stall out in the journey. And the question we're going to ask, do you, have you taken next steps? Well, I, what are my next steps? Well, let me tell you what your next steps might be. And we talk about that. And, 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 and so evaluation is not bad. Evaluation is good. Looking for evidence in ourselves, looking at our own lives and examining ourselves. How am I doing in my spiritual walk? It's legitimate. What we will find is we examine ourselves each and every single time. Remember, examine <clears throat> ourselves each and every time. And even that we're not good at. So David said, search my heart, O God, and know me. So as you live in intimacy with the Lord, he's so good at loving us and helping us. But there's a gap between where you are at this moment, regardless if you've been born again a minute, or whether you've been serving God all of your life. All of us are wanting to grow and be like Jesus, but not because we sit in judgment over the rules, and am I keeping them? This is good, this is bad. But instead, living in freedom, in the grace of God, in the tree of life, and eating of all the things that God has given me. And as I live in that way, as I check and see how I'm doing, there's a gap between where I am and where Jesus wants me to be until the day I die. We're on a journey. Say journey. And that gap is what troubles us. That gap is what was evident as this tree is sticking out. Uh, and I want to talk about, this morning as we talk about judgment-free zones, that gap, we all want to close the gap. And, and be like Jesus. That is, that is the goal of discipleship. That is the goal of spiritual growth. Henry Cloud wrote a great book called How People Grow. And uh, if you in your own heart would love to be a small group leader or be a part of helping others, I want to highly, highly recommend that you get a copy of this book and read it for yourself. And as you help others grow spiritually. A voice said, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit for this fig tree. Three years is a long time for the fig tree to be a trying hard. <laughs> and I find that most people try hard. The people that are the fig tree feel like we're sticking out and we're the only ones with the problem. We actually are trying hard. Every January, spiritual emphasis days, man, I have the list of the things I want to grow in this year. And here it is. We're coming to Easter, and I haven't checked off one of the boxes. And I did that last year, and this year, and next year. And I don't, it just seems like nothing's changing. We call that bad time. Bad time. That's not, that's not good three years spent. This is a bad three years for this tree that has problems. It feels like it's sticking out in the vineyard. For three years now, I've been coming the voice said, looking for fruit of this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down, worthless tree. Why is it using up soil? And that sense of defeat that so many people have experienced and sense that, that I'm never going to measure up for God. I'm never going to quite make it. I'm never, I'm never going to pray enough or read my Bible enough. I, I don't seem to be growing. I don't seem to be able to overcome some sin patterns that I really know that I need to have victory over. And I seem to be really stuck. And it's like bad time, three years. And, 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 and this voice in the midst of this environment that's happening here says, cut it down. Huh. Sucks to be a fig tree at that moment because you ain't never going to be fruitful if you get cut down. Think about it for a minute. If you get cut down, are you ever going to be fruitful? It's over. <laughs> Say it's over. It speaks, that's the voice of judgment, and it's not God's voice. We took time last week that God placed his wrath and his judgment on Jesus. And we're talking about the house of God. We're talking about the vineyard where we have life with Jesus. And the life of Jesus is in me. And I want it to flow from me to you. We want to create uh, uh, environments and fellowships of faith where the koinonia is flowing strong. And how does that happen? By creating environments where we understand that you cannot have the voice or attitudes of judgment because it destroys and it cuts down. This is not the voice of God. This is the voice of judgment that has its, orient, or, uh, its beginnings in Satan himself, who's trying to take people back to a law, trying to take to, back to some, uh, some, some rule system where you get to sit as judge over yourself. 
and somebody else. We've got to get rid of the voice of judgment. If we're going to grow spiritually, any of us, that voice has to be silenced, that you don't measure up. You need to try harder. You need to keep the rules, and I'll even keep you accountable to it, whatever that means. That voice can be the voice in our own heads, and many of us suffer with that. We have to learn to know whose image we've been made and listen to the voice of God. Worse than what I'm talking about today is the voice of other Christians judging because we ain't doing well. And they're just trying, they're just so, they mean well, I guess. <laughs> no, they don't. And they're just saying you need to try harder, try this scripture, try that, try this, as if, as if you haven't tried all those things for the last three years. Hold you accountable. Check on you next week. See how you're doing. The Pharisees were excellent at this in Jesus' time. You weren't godly unless you looked like a Pharisee, prayed like a Pharisee, acted like a Pharisee. You were just like a Pharisee. And if you were like a Pharisee, if you did everything that they did and upheld everything the way they said that they were doing, then you were godly. Jesus called them hypocrites. The Greek word there is actors. Because they were acting. They, what they had was lifeless and dead. In fact, he said, you've got something on the outside, but you've got nothing on the inside. You are full of dead man's bones. You are like a grave. There's no life in you. And therefore, the environments they created were death too. Put a heavy weight on people. Jesus said, all you are heavy laden. He spoke to his generation, come to me. I'm going to give you rest. You don't have to work hard at this in the way you've been told what working hard is. That spirit of judgment and death was moving amongst them. Jesus said, "For I tell you, unless the, your, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven because you don't have the life of God. You have self-righteousness, not God-righteousness. My righteousness comes from Jesus, not from myself. I live in the tree of life, not in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And like other relationship killers, judgment that we would have on how other people grow spiritually will kill them and not allow them to grow. And I don't know why we lose sight of this, but we do, like all the relationship killers, and we need to be reminded. And Paul reminded the church at Galatia, he said, who bewitched you? Who cast a spell on you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly port uh, portrayed as crucified. He died in your place. I'd just like to learn a thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by going back and working it out in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? By believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit that you're now trying to finish by going back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Three years of trying and it didn't work for this tree. For you and I, it won't work because of the Spirit of judgment. There can be no growth if the Spirit of judgment is present. Sir, the man replied, going back to our parable, leave it alone. And I love that Jesus, because he received all of God's judgment, and that's the only judgment that matters, and the judgment of this world and the judgment of the accuser of the brethren that will try and even use other Christians to accuse and say, you don't measure up, you're not enough, you're never going to, you know, and, and bringing to life this voice in our own heads, and this voice of defeat, looking for something, but it can't grow because that voice, and Jesus says, voice, hey, judgment, shut up! And he's angry about it. Je I mean, just check out the New Testament when that pharisaical voice starts to raise it. Jesus gets mad. He doesn't get angry at Christians. I, I, I see so much on social media where people are posting stuff that Jesus said to the Pharisees and aiming it at people who love and adore Jesus. And I'm going, that's pharisaical what you're doing. He didn't yell at his disciples. He yelled at the voice of those that were rooted in the godlessness of self-righteousness and judgment and portraying God in an incorrect way. And so the voice of Jesus, our advocate, says, hey, leave it alone. I will dig around it. I will dig around the roots. Who digs around our roots? Jesus digs around our roots. Who digs around our roots? Yeah, not, not, not your neighbor, not well-meaning other people. Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, digs around our root systems 
And because we were born in sin, and now I have the life of Jesus in me, his righteousness, gap, big gap, gap's getting smaller, praise God. I'm evaluating by his Holy Spirit, that's good. But Jesus needs to dig around the roots, and there's things missing in our life. We came from the factory broken and missing pieces because of sin. And if you could put those broken pieces back in there, you wouldn't need Jesus or his grace. But I want you to see today that it's not just Jesus' grace that we grow when we offer each other grace and we offer the things that we're missing that you may have come from the factory missing, but God, Jesus has put into my life. And I, it gets to flow not just directly from Jesus, but from Jesus to me, to you. It's called koinia. Remember this? And every joint supplies and the house of God grows because we're being healed. Getting from Jesus and I'm going to add from each other what we can't produce on our own, the fertilizer, what goes into the root system of our lives. That's called grace. I believe in truth. We need to look at the gap. But the Bible says he was truth and grace. But then goes on, it's gra- if we look at the order, it's grace and truth. Therefore, James said, make it your habit to confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you will be what? you will be healed. Jesus is the only one that forgives sins, but the brokenness of our lives gets healed through life in community with each other. Koinia flows because we're not trying to tell somebody how to change or they should try harder, but but when there is open non-judgment, when there are safe places where I don't feel like I'm a fig tree sticking out, but I can say, hey, I'm struggling in an area. I, I, I The Lord's dealing with a gap in my life, and I sure could use some help. And somebody else can go, hey, you're not the only one. I've been there, and the Lord is so faithful. Let me, let me pray for you today, and let's believe God for the miracle of his grace to flow into you. Hey, by the way, you were saying you struggle with your weight. Uh, I, 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 I do too, but listen, I'll tell you what. How about, how about every Monday and, and Wednesday I show up at your house at 7 o'clock and we'll just walk around the block together. Could we just do that together? I mean, it's not a lot, but I'd be willing to do that. And grace, not I'll hold you accountable because if the person could have done it, they would have already, but somebody just loves another person enough to go, In the simplest things, I want to be there with you. I want to pray for you and believe God to do what he's done in my life. But you see, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid themselves. The Bible says the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Lost means broken beyond repair. My heart continues to be, and yours is, and we just want this to expand today at Harvest. If you're struggling with something today, I was watching a podcast just this week and a lady who in full-time ministry with tears coming down her cheeks and a podcast said, I struggle with anxiety. I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't want to be judged. She said, I'm supposed to have this together. I'm not supposed to deal with anxiety because I'm a pastor's wife. And she's just unpacking this. And she talked about how she found a group of people that she felt that she was safe enough to say. And they go, oh, just that anxiety, that's all? Yeah, that's a gap. But Jesus can heal, and they began to pray for her. But it happened because she had a place where she could process the reality of her broken pieces and bring them into the light and not hide them because of shame and judgment. If you hide your broken pieces, he can't heal them. Sometimes we're begging God to heal parts of our life that he is saying, I've left that up to the body. I've left that up to your friends. Confess your faults. That word false is your gaps. It's the same one. Confess your gaps. We're just on a journey together. Truth. Oh, shame off judgment, free zone for spiritual growth. Truth without grace is judgment. That's how we grow. How are we doing? I want to keep going. I am. Here I go. I got 10 minutes, and then I'm already, ten, I'm already fi- uh, five minutes past. So here we go. I want to talk about, really quickly, the place where judgment kills when we're trying to clean up relational issues. Matthew 18, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell the church. 
But even if he refuses to hear, tell the church uh, and let him be to you a heathen or tax collector. Let me quickly unpack the most misunderstood verse in the New Testament when it comes to this stuff. First of all, we talked about offense. Forgiveness, I've already covered it. But you just know you got to go have a conversation. I talked about my story with my dad. You just know you got to clean it up. We got to talk about it. We got to get good with one another. Go and tell the person that you have the fault with, but not before you, you contact your small group. Hey, me and Jim are going to be having some, uh, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. We got that thing we got to clean up. Can you be in prayer about that? We just need everybody in prayer about the big meeting me and Jim are going to have. No. Stop it. You don't have to tell anybody you're meeting. You don't even need prayer covering. Holy Spirit's really into this. He wants to be there for you. You don't even have to ask on this one. Go and tell his fault between you and him. What? Alone. This is an alone thing. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Let me quickly break this down. Here are the, here are the goals of going to talk to somebody that you just feel disjointed. Remember where every joint supplies. And you used to have a joint there. You used, you used to have some koinea flow. It was really good. But man, something happened and he hurt me. And it just, I don't, it, it's just, it's been too painful. And rah, it's disjointed. Let's put it back in the joint. It's safe enough to do it. I have forgiven. But now we got to clean this up. The goal of this interaction is you being heard and winning your brother. You being heard, that means he will listen to you or she will listen to you. You've been heard and gaining your brother. This is not judicial. This is not a court of law. A lot of people are quick, you know. Paul the Apostle said, don't take your brother to a court of law. Did you even know why that's in there? <laughs> people misunderstand and misuse that. We're not to solve relational issues one with the other by determining with a judge who's right and who's wrong. Will you come and sit as a mediator? I've done enough marriage counseling. I tell, I tell couples now, I learned, this, I learned this really early on, and Christine and I know this really well. If somebody wants to sit in between you with a referee shirt on, that is the biggest waste of time on planet Earth of trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong in a relationship that's disjointed. Because somebody's going to be so right, they're wrong. Self, you know, Self-righteousness, self-justification, everything's going to rise up. It'll be a mess. Say mess. But somehow when you look into one another's eyes and you can just stop the judicial nonsense long enough, who's right, who's wrong, you said, it's all rehearsed, oh, I'm there to tell them when they're Instead of, wait a minute, I do need to share how I'm feeling about this. And I really want to be heard. That, that, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And then the result of that, 99.9 .9 is relational joining again. Something has happened that's caused you pain and disappointment. It's affected the relationship. We want to get it cleaned up. So you want to deal with what they did, not why they did it which is a judgment. And so often when we come to the table to work out relational issues, we've already formed judgments as to why they did what they did. And what you're really trying to prove and bring your evidence to is you are trying to prove their motive for what they did. That's what's stinging. You're dealing with a false judgment that you don't know the heart, you don't know the why, and they probably don't know either. But the what is real. Like think about this moronic way of raising kids where you catch your kid doing something wrong, you sit him down, the teacher says, or something, you sit him down, you go, why did you do that? <laughs> they get this blank look on their face. <laughs> I don't know. And then we get really angry with them that they don't know why they did it. <laughs> and if you do that long enough, what we train them to do is come up with a really good reason they start to learn that if you actually answer the question and come up with a good reason why you did it, you can get away with rotten behavior and be self-justified. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything wrong. 
Why are you telling me about this? But if you tell a kid or ask a kid, what did you do? They can tell you almost every time. And if you say to them, if you could do that over again, what would you do? They can answer that one too. And then they learn. And it's not trying to drill down into the motivations and judgments of why they did it, but they can deal with bad behavior of what they did. So when you sit down with somebody, you have to go in without the judgment of the why. And we do it. We, oh, we do it every time. We do it with our husbands and wives. You don't think you're going to do it with somebody? Because we say, well, I know them so well. You know how you are. Wow, tree of knowledge of good and evil. If your spouse is beside you, don't poke them hard right now. The times where Christine and I have got stuck merrily, will go to, it'll come down to where I have formed a judgment. And I'm convinced of my judgment because I know her well. Think how that in relationships, covenant relationships in the house of God as we being to know people, and we'll go to, we'll go, you know how you are because they've shared some weaknesses and it's their weakness maybe that's hurt you. But you know how you are. I need you to, no. You need to simply say, this is what you did. And when you did this, it felt this way to me. And it hurt. Henry Cloud says that our tears are in our, in our eye ducts so they can be seen. They're not in our armpits so that we can hide them. They could have been. God could have put your tears in your armpits. A lot of people wish they were. But in that moment of vulnerability, as you look in as somebody, you look into their soul, if I've caused somebody pain and I didn't, it was unintentional, it doesn't matter, the intentionality even, their pain causes me to go, I am so sorry that you experienced that. And they've been hurt. If you haven't been hurt, real quick to finish, because so we could just kind of unpack that. I think you get that. Um, practice that in your marriages, in our relationships. Um, it's hard, but it's necessary, and it needs grace, and it gives grace, and it's beautiful. You'll win your brother. You'll win your husband. You'll, win, you'll get back in the joint. Well, what if you haven't been heard? That you can take somebody else, but they're not there to referee. They're there to sit down because you might be being heard. Roy, Christina did hear you. Chris, just say again, what did, what did you hear him say? Well, I heard him say that when I did this, it caused pain. And she heard you, Roy. Yeah, but she should be sorry or something. They don't have to agree with you. Remember, it's not about right and wrong. They, you just have to be heard. But again, so often in being heard, it does create an environment where it can be processed and cleansed. And so it might be, you need to just be assured yet you were heard. Or the other person isn't hearing. The other person might, so, but, but do you see that Roy's not looking for an apology. Roy's not looking. He just, I, did, you, did you hear what he said? Well, I don't care what he said. I didn't do anything wrong. And then it says, take the next step and treat them like a heathen or a tax collector. And that simply means they've never experienced koinia. So we're trying to treat them like a believer we're trying to treat them like somebody who has the life of Jesus in them. We're not judging. We're just saying, uh, you're welcome. To, like, we don't excommunicate and kick people out because we had tribunals and go, oh, well, you didn't have the judicial. I should go. But in my heart, how do I resolve the fact that I wasn't heard? Like, you just, you didn't even give me the simple courtesy of being heard. Well, then they don't have that capacity. We're just going to pray for their salvation. Or at least they're in the journey of salvation and they're not quite there yet and, and, and they will be soon. And don't be surprised if they don't come back and say, hey, remember that conversation we had? I, you know what? I, I, I didn't get it. Holy Spirit's been doing it. I get it. How are we doing? Judgment-free zone? We're going to try? Work hard at that? Let's pray for it. Lord, we ask every head bowed and eye closed. Lord, we ask right now. We all know, we, 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 we all love grace. We love grace from you, <laughs> and we love grace from others. What if truth be told, we love to mete out justice because we like to sit on the throne and we like to judge because we think we're just like God. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'm laughing, but it's so awful. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, I pray that the, that the coiny killer of judgment will be hunted out in this house and we will live in the grace that you've supplied and give it to each other for spiritual growth and cleaning up our relationships. With every head bowed just before, the worship team sings and just stay in this uh, uh, posture. If you're here today, you've never invited Jesus into your life. Today's the day you want to receive salvation. I would just invite you to pray this simple prayer. We're all going to pray it together. Just ask Jesus to come into your heart now like this. Dear Jesus, let's all pray together. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. Come in my life. Forgive my sins. Give me that new life. I receive it today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, we believe if you prayed that from your heart, you're born again. Online, you can text in. I pray today to receive Jesus. Let's stand to our feet today. Let's just sing this before we're dismissed. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I Feel it, you work working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Oh, oh, oh. where you make it, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are where you make it, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Just want to remind you that our ministry team will be just want to remind you that our ministry team will be here at the front we love to pray and believe for miracles whatever you have need of today we want to stand with you where two shall agree as touching is done in jesus name father we thank you for sundays father we thank you for the gathering of the family father we thank you for testing words and and calling us closer and lord for breaking off chains and god I just thank you for who you are. Father, I just pray a blessing over each and every person this morning. God, their families, just take them this week, Father. Give them um, just great blessings over their work week and their, their family time, God, and bring us all back together next week. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Blessed, God bless Harvest. you. Have an amazing week.